I still remember the first time I met Peter Rhee. I went to, I was working with the Canadian military at that time, and uh, we flew to LA to talk about research on hypertonic sailing. And I remember being impressed because Peter said that the day before he was on call and he had done five emergency thoracotomies. Now, being a Canadian, uh, I don't see five thoracotomies in Toronto for, in a year, and he had that uh, the, the night before. So I remember being really impressed also with his fantastic lab. So thank you very much. It's really a privilege to be uh, here at this meeting. And thank you also for the topic. This is a beautiful talk. So let's talk about massive bleeding. And let's talk also, the hard part is, what is the evidence-based treatment? And I'll already tell you, there's not much good evidence actually to support anything with a massive bleeding. So this is my only disclosure, so unless you ask me anything about 7A, I'm fine. Okay, massive bleeding. Massive bleeding, I have no doubt, is one of the most interesting topics today in trauma. One that you open Journal of Trauma today, you open it next month, there's always at least one or two new papers on the topic. And the reason, one there is it's so hot, is because that's the primary responsibility of the general surgeon. Orthopedic surgeons fix bone, neurosurgeons deal with brain, general surgeons in trauma stop bleeding. That's what we do. That's one of our primary responsibilities. So I'll try to bring together everything that's coming out every month in every journal of trauma, anything related to trauma. I'll see if I can put together in the next 20 minutes. So my talk is divided in two parts. Number one is why trauma patients bleed so much. And the better answer is why they can't stop bleeding. And the second one is once we know why they can't stop bleeding, is that how do we treat them? Okay. So this is another reason why general surgeons like so much massive bleeding. The fact is that overall, number one cause of death in trauma is head injury, but after the patient arrives to the hospital, the main cause of death is bleeding. So after the patient sees me, after I take them to the operating room and I open their chest, I open their abdomen, the main cause of death is that they will not stop bleeding and they will die. So that's why general surgeons you know, are so frustrated, actually, and so interested in the topic. So let's start by defining what is massive bleeding. And I'll tell you, just like, like Dr. Balog, too, I couldn't find a good definition for massive bleeding. We all know what it is, but there's not a good definition. There are some weird definitions. Like, I love this one here. It's a loss of 150 ml per minute. So Peter, how many patients have you seen losing 150 ml per minute? That's, how do you measure that? In practice, it's, it makes no sense. So it's these definitions here are actually impossible to measure in practice. So the best definition for massive bleeding is actually one of the worst definitions for massive bleeding, and it is how much blood you give to these patients. The way I like to see massive bleeding is a patient that's gonna lose their whole blood volume in a matter of minutes, a matter of hours, no, not even hours, maybe in a matter of minutes. That's from his massive bleeding. So even though it's a horrible definition, one of the best one is more than 10 units of red blood cells in 24 hours. So automatically, massive bleeding, the patient has to be hypotensive. There's no massive bleeding with normal tensive patients, number one. Number two, if your patient at the end gets three, four, five units of blood, sorry, that was not massive bleeding, even though you thought was massive bleeding. Massive bleeding needs patient to get around 10 units of blood unless they died. So why patients, trauma patients bleed so much? Because they can't clot. That's the reason. So. There's a pivotal paper published in 2003 by a British surgeon called Brahe. And until 2003, we thought that this problem, an inability to clot, was because the patients bled too much, because we gave too much normal saline to these patients, because they become cold, long gone. 2003, Brahe showed that coagulopathy trauma is something inherent. In fact, you don't have to give a single drop of blood, they don't have a single blood of, 
Ringer's lactate, you don't have to anything. The only thing is that if you have a traumatized body, this patient, one in four of these patients are going to be coagulopathic, are going to have a defect in clotting. Okay? And if these patients become coagulopathic, what also Brohe showed in a very simple paper published in Journal of Trauma, is that if they can't clot appropriately, one in four of these patients will die, no matter what you do. So until 2003, we thought coagulopathy was something late, something caused by our resuscitation. In 2003, we learned, nope, this is inherent to trauma. It occurs actually very early, and you have to deal with it early on. You can't wait. So let's talk a little bit about coagulopathy and trauma. What do we know about this fascinating topic that actually has given me a few grants, and I hope that will continue to give me many grants in the future, trying to understand why does a traumatized patient can't clot? So what do we know? We know it's early. We know it is associated to shock. So the more the patient's in shock, the more profound the shock, more likely they are to be unable to clot and to tissue destruction. So that picture from that soldier with that crushed leg and so on, I can bet that they are now as abnormal that patient. Okay? So we know that. The other thing that we know is that the traumatized patient is anticoagulated. Would be as if you had injected heparin into their veins. The problem is the body doesn't inject heparin. The body what does, it releases a potent anticoagulant called activated protein C. We know that now. Why does the body do that? Again, I hope to get many grants to figure that out. But the fact is the APC is the most potent anticoagulant we have in our body. And for some reason, after trauma, the body released this anticoagulant. So your traumatized patient, you deal with it as if they had heparin on board. And on top of that, not only they, the patients are anticoagulated, they can't form a clot, but also if they form a clot, that clot lyses too fast. We call that hyperfibrinolysis, and that has been associated with the release of something else called tissue plasminogen activator. So that's what we know, and these were just scratching the surface of this. The other thing that we know is that, is that coagulopathy is complex. It's not that simple. It's not just the patient is anticoagulated and has too much clot lysis. There's much more to that. It's much more complex than that. And uh, I'll just give you an example. So I told you that hyperfibrinolysis is because the body released TPA. So we measure TPA in our patients. I'll show on this part here, on this side here. This is, the blue lines are the normal range of TPA. The, the red line are patients who are coagulopathic. And you can see that actually they have a massive release of TPA in the first three hours. After that, TPA drops. And the problem is it takes three hours for the body to produce an inhibitor of TPA called PI-1. But then when it produces, it jumps up. So what does that mean? Means, number one, this coagulopathy is not simple. It's not only TPA. It's a balance of many things. The second thing, coagulopathy changes over time. If I see this patient here, in the first three hours, I have to give something anti-TPA. But if I see this patient after three hours and I give something anti-TPA, I'm causing a disservice. I'm causing harm to this patient. So coagulopathy in trauma is something that's early. It's inherent to trauma. It's complex. It changes over time. So it's much more complicated than we ever thought before 2003. Okay, great, huh? Excellent news. So now we have to deal with these patients. So how do we manage this patient? How do we treat these patients? And uh, the fact is that today you cannot resuscitate a massively bleeding trauma patient without taking coagulopathy into consideration. So today, if, if Brohe showed that one in four patients with severe traumas cannot clot appropriately, if they are massively bleeding, I'll tell you it's 100%. So you have to start resuscitating these patients, putting right in your brain that you're dealing with someone that can't clot appropriately. Okay? Maybe they can't clot at all. 
So let's see what are the evidence behind management of these patients who are massively bleeding. This is the extreme of bleedings. Okay, remember, patient transfused five, six units of blood, that's not a massive transfusion patient, massive bleeding patient in my definition. Okay. So what do we know about managed massive bleeding? And that's interesting because we're talking all these sophisticated 21st century things, and I start talking management using a paper published 20 years ago because this is still correct. So this was a paper published by Biko and Mattox. This was a, a key paper in the literature. In fact, I remember talking about this paper when it was 10 years old. So now it's 20 years old, I'm still talking about it. So this paper showed us one thing. If you have anyone bleeding, the first priority is you have to stop the bleeding. The first priority is not to give blood, it's not to give Ringer's lactate, it's not to give normal saline, it's to stop the bleeding. And this study was, uh, showed that if you give fluid or blood before the, patient, the bleeding is controlled, survival. If you, if you give blood or fluid after the bleeding is controlled, then the survival is much better, and this was shown to be statistically significant. So the top priority in anyone who's massively bleeding, or anyone who's bleeding, in fact, is that you have to stop the bleeding. Okay? It's not, not, not resuscitation, not fluid or blood. Okay, how about fluid and blood? It's time to talk about it, and that's where we start having some controversies, and I'm being nice uh, using controversy as the word to define it. So until 2003, that's what we did. Right? So until 2003, we resuscitated, we resuscitated massive bleeding trauma patients using a combination of surgeon intuition and lab-guided. We like to think that we, we did go-directed, lab-guided resuscitation, but it's not. Okay? We use a little bit of our own intuition, and then we, we used some lab. And basically what we did is that we gave lots of crystalloids to our patients, we started giving two liters, two liters of normal saline, and then when the INR would come back and show the INR was above 1.1, we would give plasma. When the hemoglobin was below 100, we would give red cells and so on. And remember, what is the first cause of death after the patient arrives in the hospital? Bleeding. The patient doesn't stop bleeding. So actually, if you look back, maybe we were not actually treating the patients adequately. Because you're always catching up. You're always running after the problem. The INR has to be abnormal for you to give plasma. Okay? So there's no evidence it works. And the problem is labs take long, too long, for a patient who's bleeding to death. You can't wait 40 minutes for the INR before giving plasma. In 40 minutes, my massive bleeding patient may not need plasma anymore. So it's too long. And also, we know that INR was never meant for trauma. It, they change the temperature, they change the pH when they go to the lab. It's not a good test, to be honest. So uh, despite some novel proposals, like Chandler, the published in Transfusion 2010, to make your lab go faster in giving the results, a lot of us have abandoned this go-directed, lab-guided type of resuscitation. So what, what are we many, uh, the, the, only, oh, sorry, the only thing that has changed related, uh, related to lab-guided is the coming up into scene of something called thrombolastometry. And I hope I'll just uh, tweak a little bit on that because I want you to be back for my next talk. That will be exactly on this fascinating uh, new lab test called thrombolastometry. So two instruments measure it, and actually what they do, they measure the whole clotting from beginning to end, from how long does it take for the clot to form, how fast the clot forms, how strong the clot is, and how quickly the clot lyses. And because you see the whole clotting system, you can say, look, the problem with this patient is too much lysis, or not enough strength of the clot. So you can identify the problem, and you can treat it. So you know this patient needs platelet and not plasma, for example. Okay? So, and the other beautiful thing about TAG and Rotem is that they diagnose something that no other test does, that is excessive breaking down of the clot. I'll talk more about that later on today. So we have lab-guided as one option for you to resuscitate massive bleeding patients, but then we have something new that we call damage control resuscitation. 
So damage control resuscitation was first proposed in paper in 2007. Many surgeons have proposed it, probably recognized John Holcomb as probably the most present, the most uh, uh, seen per person uh, proposing damage control resuscitation. Basically, they say, if you have a soldier like the one we saw on Dr. Davis' presentation, you don't start resuscitating this patient with ringers lactate of saline. What you do, you restart resuscitating this patient with whole blood. If they are losing whole blood, you have to give back whole blood. Incredible, huh? Who thought of that? Who, who was the genius who thought of that? The problem is you ask for whole blood and there's no whole blood. Whole blood doesn't exist. So what, what he said then, if you don't have whole blood, what you do, you give RBCs, plasma, and platelets at a one-to-one -one ratio. So that's more or less whole blood. Okay? And you go very aggressive, you start with blood, you don't start Ringer's lactate, you hold on the Ringer's lactate, don't give Ringer's lactate, give blood, no lab, don't worry about lab, just keep on pouring blood, pouring blood, pouring blood, pouring blood, until the patient stop bleeding or die. Okay? That's great. And actually, it was a revolution, it was a revolution, it was widely accepted, particularly in this country. So many trauma centers now have thawed plasma at their door. Many have the helicopter going to the scene. And there's many reviews on their experience comparing traditional resuscitation, lab-guided, versus one-to-one. -one. And basically, except for Scalia, everybody else showed there was a dramatic reduction in mortality. Sometimes 50% reduction in mortality, 40%, at least 30% reduction in mortality were seen when you used damage control resuscitation. So very exciting, quickly adopted, even though the evidence is not that good, but it also has been criticized. One of the reasons is it's impossible to drop 50% mortality in trauma to start with. There's something wrong here. There's, there's no more than 3% of the death are preventable. So are you talking reduced mortality in 50%? Something's wrong. All the studies are retrospective, except the one we just finished in my own hospital. We just finished a one-to-one. -one. It's submitted to a journal. It's being assessed, and that's why I'm not going to show you the results. But if you want to talk to me over coffee, I'll be glad to tell you the results. It's all the studies to date, except our own, are retrospective. And, uh, and also, you never know who's going to need 10 units. Often these patients, they go to the operating room, they stop bleeding in unit three or four. Now, all of a sudden, a patient who got three or four units of red cells also got platelets, also got plasma, and you think there's no consequence to that? Actually, there is. And there was a study published, one of the studies was published by my colleague Kenji Naba, again from LA, and, it's, uh, and that's a problem. You never know who's really going to need, who really is massively bleeding, and the big criticism has been the survivorship bias of all the literature on one-to-one, -one. and the question is based, can be summarized like, did the patients live longer because they got plasma, or did they get plasma because they live longer? Who came first? So that has been a big criticism on that. Okay, but this is United States of America. The Europeans actually thought it slightly different. They also had something similar, but instead of giving plasma and platelets, what they do, they give fibrinogen. Very interesting, huh? completely different blood product. And, and what's interesting is that using fibrinogen, the Europeans are showing the same results as we are here in North America using one-to-one. -one. Again, same criticisms, same problems, same limitations. I told you about DCR. I can tell you about the European studies. They're all retrospective. They all show results that are hard, sometimes difficult to, to believe that they actually are correct. So not good evidence, actually, but, that's, but that makes sense. In fact, if you want to form a clot, all you need is fibrinogen and a little bit of platelets. Get fibrinogen, platelets, shake, you've got a clot. So actually, it's not a bad idea. And the fact is, fibrinogen is the first one to drop. It's the first one to go to critically low levels if you're bleeding. Not platelets. Platelets are actually very late on, for example. And we start with platelets when we do DCR. So the Europeans actually believe so much in fibrinogen that actually the European guidelines say that if you have a massive bleeding patients, 
you should actually not wait until the fibrinogen drops below normal levels. Actually, you should give fibrinogen even if the fibrinogen levels are normal, because no one knows how much fibrinogen they need. No one knows. And actually, they show the more fibrinogen you give, less they bleed. One of the reasons I think the Europeans love fibrinogen, I think there are two reasons. One is because they have Rotem, and I'll talk more about Rotem later on. Rotem quickly identifies the lack of fibrinogen, while here in North America we have to measure fibrinogen and takes even longer than the INR to come back. The second reason, because in Europe, and in Canada too, and that I'm very proud to say, we have fibrinogen concentrate. So, so they can give fibrinogen concentrate instead of giving cryoprecipitate. Okay, so there we have. We have damage control resuscitation. We have the traditional lab-guided, go-directed resuscitation. Now what? Both have problems. Both have limitations. Not good evidence on either side. What do we do? Good question. So what we did in Toronto last year, we got a lot of experts to invite them over for three days there in Toronto. We went to a nice hotel, you know, and over three days we fought about on top of this weak evidence to come up with a consensus. The consensus was published last year as well too in Critical Care in 2011, and that's actually what I'll bring to you now as probably the best evidence on how to manage someone who's bleeding to death, how to manage someone that is virtually losing their whole circulatory volume, okay? So this is not my opinion, this was the opinion that got together and was published by a whole bunch of people who think they know something about bleeding and coagulopathy. One of the things that this consensus guideline brought up, actually, that I found was very interesting, is very simple. First of all, if your hospital sees massive bleeding patients, you need a protocol how to deal with these patients. Sorry. You need a protocol how to deal with these patients. That's tremendously interesting. Before you see a massive bleeding patient, you have to sit down at the blood bank with the lab, with the operating room, and say, look, guys, if we get someone bleeding to death, what are we going to do? And then the blood bank says, okay, if you get someone bleeding to death, we'll start sending you plasma and platelets as quickly as possible. The operating room is going to open an OR for you immediately. The lab is going to put your, pla your, your lab test on priority, and we're going to call you back with the results or whatever. You do whatever you need in your hospital. And that's very interesting that there is actually evidence just by going through this exercise of developing a predetermined, coordinated, multidisciplinary protocol that you reduce mortality. There's a beautiful study by Cotton you know, that uh, Cotton showed that in civilian hospitals, they develop a massive transfusion protocol. They institute the massive transfusion protocol, and they never reach one-to-one. -one. Their goal was to give one-to-one, -one, and they never did. But mortality dropped. What the heck? So is that one-to-one, -one, or is that the fact that they have a protocol? And that's interesting that there's the contrary, too. There's some military papers showing that the militaries are very organized, and then they institute a protocol on top of something that was already very organized, and they went to one-to-one. -to -one. All the soldiers are getting one-to-one, -one, and mortality didn't drop. So massive transfusion protocols, I think that today the evidence says you have to have one. You have to think before you see a trauma patient. Transamic acid. So that's, I'll just go short here, best evidence that exists in trauma today. There's nothing with better evidence than transamic acid. And that's incredible that most of us still don't use it. So a study published in Lancet 2010, there are a few other studies as well too on transamic acid. There's actual lab evidence that these patients release have excessive fibrinolysis. What transamic acid today, the evidence suggests is that in the first three hours of anyone who's bleeding, or maybe bleeding, you should give transamic acid, and there's a drop in mortality. A little tiny drop, but actually there's a drop in mortality. So I think that today, if you're going to go evidence-based, you have to give transamic acid to all your patients who are bleeding. If they're massive bleeding, then, then it's easy. You don't even have to think. Okay. So let me stop here. I have still five minutes. This is the very last slide. So this is putting everything together. This is all, I don't know, 30 heads thinking together, and we came up with this. Those are the Canadian guidelines for massive, trans for massive bleeding. Okay. 
So what is the evidence-based management of someone who's bleeding to death? So let's start. Number one, even before you see any trauma patient, your hospital must have a massive transfusion protocol. Would be unacceptable that you have a trauma center that has, is not prepared to deal with a massive bleeding trauma patients. And you have to sit down. It's not just you as a surgeon. It's you, the blood bank, ICU, OR, and lab. You have to sit down. You need a protocol. Okay, that's it. Now, the patient arrived. Patient's bleeding to death. What's the top priority? Top priority, of course, is what we all learned in the last 100 years. You have to stop the bleeding. You have to think, where's the bleeding, and how can I stop this as quickly as possible? And that's where general surgeons are, you know, and, and our colleagues from interventional radiology are becoming more and more relevant on this respect. How about fluid and blood resuscitation for these patients? What do we do now? We have the conflicting lab-guided and damage control resuscitation. I'll tell you, for massive bleeding patients, if a patient comes to me and I think this patient is going to die next few minutes, I close my eyes and I throw everything on this patient. And this is called damage control resuscitation. So in my hospital, as soon as a massive bleeding patient comes in, I start getting boxes from the blood bank with one, two, one, two, one. For every RBC, I have one of plasma, I have one of platelet. And I start giving to my patients without thinking, blindly. But then, what do I do? I switch to a lab-guided as quickly as I can. And the reason is, I may be giving platelets to a patient who needs fibrinogen. I may be giving four units of plasma when my patient needs 40 units of plasma, not four. So you can't go blinded all the way for hours and hours and hours. You have to switch to something that can give you a direction and can show you what the problem is and how to deal with that. And in the end, anyone that's bleeding in my hospital gets transamic acid. Small dose, safe dose, the dose proposed by the, by the CRASH-2 study. Okay. Summarizing, stop the bleeding. Massive bleeding patients, first thing you have to do is stop the bleeding. If you don't stop, they're going to die, by definition. Okay. Second of all, start blindly giving blood to this patient. Keep the crystalloids away. Right. And if you're in Europe, you start giving fibrinogen, but I don't think anyone here is in Europe, works in Europe, uh, but you know, in, in, in North America, we start with plasma and platelets and RBCs, where I'm trying to stop the bleeding, and I give transamic acid to these patients, and then as quickly as possible, I start getting lab, so then it can tell me what the, my patient really needs and where the problem is, and that's where TAG and Rotem can be very helpful. So I hope this was clear, and once again, I want to thank you very much for the privilege to be here.